we got some great stories come up today, including the fact that the Chicago White Sox made a splash. Okay, you're all thinking, hey, when are some moves going to happen? Well, the White Sox, they're making moves, and they signed Liam Hendricks. Quite simply, this guy has been the best reliever in baseball since 2019. He signs a three-year deal with the White Sox for $54 million. Now, interesting contract, $15 million club option for 2024 or a buyout for $15 million over a designated period of time. So bottom line is this, he is exactly the shot in the arm this White Sox bullpen needed. And right. Al, I think the conversation now becomes comes, hey, already favorite in the AL Central, they might be the favorite in the American League. How great is Hendricks? Yeah. So pretty cool contract, right? You got a three-year guarantee, what, 11, 12, 13, with this buyout, whether you're deserving or not, for $15 million. First I've ever heard of that. Have you ever right? heard of that? No, that's what, when I, when I saw this, I'm like, three for, was it three or four for 54? But right. good for him. And I think it's a terrific story beyond, because we did have him on uh, with, with the best relievers at the end of the year uh, in, with the award show. And I, and I think when you look at guys, and I believe this in my heart, when you don't give up, here's a guy with Minnesota, goes to Toronto, was a starter, back and forth, found his place as a reliever, gets to Oakland, and really was kind of up and down. In 2018, guys, Liam Hendricks, who just signed the highest AAV of any reliever in the history of our sport, <laughs> was sent to the minor leagues in Nashville, and he was DFA, which means any team could have just plucked him and put him on their 40-man roster. And they didn't. And he found himself to get a 177 and a 178, and of course this year, you know, with the shortened season. So good for him, and what a contract. Well, the thing that I look at him, and you talked about a guy not giving up, right? So he went back to the drawing board. He gets DFA'd, uh, goes into that 2018 wintertime, and he starts to change his repertoire. He starts to dig into the analytics and clearly went from a two-seamer. When he got to the big leagues, he was, he was a two-seamer, mm -hmm. throwing about 90 miles an hour. Now he goes to – he totally gets away from the two-seamer, goes to the four-seamer, and now his velocity is up to 96 miles an hour. He became a totally different pitcher. Same strength, same arm strength, but he just changed his approach. And I think we're seeing more and more of that with pitchers trying to figure out what is the best for me. Yes, maybe I learned a, a two-seamer when I was a young kid and it worked for me in college, but now that I'm in the big leagues, I need to change my repertoire. I need to change it. We, so we're seeing spin, spin rates gone up with his four-seamer, spin rates gone up with his breaking balls, and you have to love this guy's approach. I mean, he is just that Aussie yeah. out there ready to yeah. just take you by the throat. you got to love that as a closer. L let me add to that, Val, because in addition to two-seamer and four-seamer, here's a guy when you kind of are finding yourself, and I'm with you. This guy's a rah, you know, he is the epitome of what I think Gossage and the old school snarling guy, and I love it. But what he did was he went to the minor leagues, and as simple as – what do you need to do? He was a long toss guy. Now, not to get into the weeds of long toss and how far. Some organizations don't allow you to go more than a certain amount of feet. So when he went down to the minor leagues, he's like, I, I need to throw more. So when you're in this quandary of a starter in mind that every five days, even though he's been a reliever, you're not really sure of the usage and how much you throw. Mm -hmm. And he went to the minor leagues in Nashville and started long tossing far, a lot. And it actually helped elevate his velocity, gain confidence, much crisper, really good two-pitch mix. Came up that year, in, uh, the following year, 1.8, and then this year at 178. So I don't know if it's a light bulb scenario, but his routine actually helped him really Get him where he is now. Yeah, the trajectory is amazing. You know, signed from Australia. He was a starter of the Royals and Jays. Doesn't work out. Big in the analytics. Codify. He understands different things. Yep. And it's those secondary pitches, Val. You look at the numbers. He's up there right there with Denelson Lamette. Like every closer, you got to have wipeout stuff. You certainly have to have a great fastball, in his case, a yep. four-seamer. But his off-speed stuff, that is filthy. And he can throw it on any count. Well, the fact that he would come at you with a 96-mile-an-hour fastball and then has secondary stuff that is swing and miss – so everything that he comes at you with is swing and miss. And you start looking at the numbers, right, digging in. 13 strikeouts per nine innings to go against only two walks per nine innings. So you talk about power and command as a closer. Wow, what a combination. How about, wow, what a team the yes. White Sox are putting together. They were seventh in MLB with, 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 with their relievers last year. Uh, adding him, looks like Colomay's got to be gone, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to have two closers. Uh, Aaron Bummer really found him. Top 10 reliever we had last night.
Evan Marshall, I like him. Ross Detweiler, we saw Aaron Crochet, the guy at the University of Tennessee, the uh, uh, first round. Garrett Crochet, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, Garrett Crochet, yeah, they're right there. I mean, guys, we know the dynamic of their offense. Mm -hmm. And then the addition of Lance Lynn, dare I say, is this the team to beat in the American League? Yeah, you start to say, listen, identify weaknesses, let's pick it up a little bit, Al. They were behind Minnesota and Cleveland, both those teams in their division in terms of their bullpen. So let's bolster this. Yep. Lance Lynn, I know you like a lot. I this do. guy, he's not just an innings either. He's effective. He's strong. Giolito is a Cy Young candidate. Their offense is really good. I'm with you. This isn't just best team in the Central. I feel pretty confident about that. I think maybe best team in the American League. The Rays have lost two of their star pitchers in Morton and Snell. The Yankees, we don't know about LeMahieu, three of their starters. I, I like the White Sox a lot. I do. I do. I really <laughs> do. I mean, it's easy to fall in love. I and mean, we, we talked about the Padres and the White Sox last year yes. going into spring training, young kids. This is an interesting team. Mm -hmm. They bring Keuchel in. Giolito's figured it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the new arm action, great changeup, good stuff. First rounder several years ago with the Nets. Put Keuchel in there, who had a very good year. Lefty. Right, left, and now Lance Lynn. Lance Lynn is about as old school as they come. The beard and his whole look says like Burly yeah, guy. Somewhere like <laughs> softball league. Yeah, yes, come where's, out. Where's Dennis Camp? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, back in the day. I love it. I, I think what the White Sox are doing, uh, we'll talk more about it. Of course, Michael Kopech's interesting. He chose not to play last year because of COVID. Great arm from the Red Sox system. It's a good team. You mean you Dennis know, Lamp, though, right? On the Blue Jays? With the Fu Manchu? Yeah, yeah, Dennis Lamp. That's what I was yeah, thinking. Him, like, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, Dennis Camp, also awesome. Look him up. Go ahead. I was just thinking of Kopech, right? He took off best last year because of COVID, but he was coming off of Tommy John. It's probably almost a good thing for him to have that year and a half of just resting his arm to come back in full strength. But yeah. this team does not have a weakness at this point in time. It's not in their starting rotation, it's not in their bullpen, and it's certainly not in that lineup with all that young power that they've got. It's not a weakness, it is a concern though. You got a manager who's 76 years of age. Now I know Tony La Russa's no, one world come series, on, but there's some thought, Al, can he adapt to analytics, the modern game? Itself? Yes. yes. Do you think it's a no-brainer? Yes, oh my God. Tim Anderson, him get along, no problem? Yes, yes. He had, Mankata, no listen, issues. Tony, while he hasn't managed in several years since the Cardinals, he's been in the game. Right, Red Sox. He backs Red Sox. You know, so this isn't like he's just flying in and landing and saying, hello, I, uh, <laughs> who are you guys? You know, he's been around. Right. And listen, he's smart enough to know, like, you know, less is more and right. go ahead, boys. So, And th this is the type of team you write up the lineup and you just get out of their way. Right. Yep. You know, there, there's not a lot of Are you concerned? Parts. I just think there's a little bit of feel of, like, listen, there's such a focus on these young managers, analytics heavy, mixing and matching. Maybe La Russa's, listen, the game changes so much. Verducci was telling me, in the last five years, look how much the game has changed with shifting and moving your bullpen. I know, I know, listen, Tony was instrumental with the way he used Eck. But, are you but it saying, changes so quick. So is there a stubbornness to an old guy who doesn't want to do it? Nah. I just, I, maybe, maybe. Yeah. That might be the conversation that right. we're talking about. Because I have to May. look at some way. Okay, listen, past history, they haven't been successful. I don't think that's a big deal. Though People say, well, the White Sox haven't won a lot of playoff games in their history. I go, well, whatever. It's new players. I don't worry about that. But I say, do you have the right chemistry right out of the gate? That I don't know.